Hello lovelies, I'm True Crime Caitlin and welcome back to my channel and another True Crime Case. Before we start a day, I just want to wish all of my lovely viewers a happy new year. I hope that 2023 brings you all the love, health and happiness in the world. For today's case, we're going to be going back many, many years and talking about Britain's first female serial killer, Mary Ann Cotton. There are a lot of names in today's case, so I'm going to try my best just to keep it as simple as possible for you all. Before continuing to listen, please check the description box below for my disclaimer and for any trigger warnings. On the 31st of October, 1832, Michael and Margaret Robson welcomed their first daughter, Mary Ann, into the world. Mary Ann was born into a small mining village named Low Mosley, which is in Durham in the northeast. At this time, Durham was dominated by the mining industry. So like many of the men, Michael worked as a miner while Margaret stayed at home and happily settled into the role of a wife and mother. Mary had two younger siblings, a sister named Margaret who sadly died at only a few months old in 1834 and a brother named Robert who was born in 1835. The family followed the Christian Methodist religion and I didn't really know what that was so I looked it up and the definition according to the Collins Dictionary is Methodists are Christians who follow the teachings of John Wesley who have their own branch of the Christian church and their own form of worship. Mary regularly attended Sunday school where she was described as quote a most exemplary and regular attender and a girl of innocent disposition and average intelligence. In 1840 Michael had got a new job in a nearby village named Merton working in the Merton Colliery. This new job provided housing for the family so everyone upped and made the move. Life was pretty normal until February 1842 when Michael had fallen 150 metres to his death down a mine shaft while at work. Mary was nine years old at the time. Michael's death was devastating to his wife and children and to make matters worse, Margaret, Mary and Robert were evicted from their home which was provided to them because of Michael's job. By 1843, Margaret remarries another miner named George Stott. I know that to us today, this new marriage can seem really sudden. I mean, Michael had only died the year before and now Margaret is already remarrying, but back then this was completely normal. Men needed a woman to look after their kids as because sometimes they would lose their wives in childbirth. They needed someone to keep their house clean and to cook for them, etc and the women needed someone to provide for them. As Mary was growing up, she could see the life that her mother and pretty much all of the other women in her life were living, and she didn't want that life. She didn't want to have the life of a miner's wife, having masses of children, relying on a man, being tied down to just one man, or the cooking and the cleaning, etc. So at 16 years old, she moved out of the family home and began working as a domestic servant. Mary worked for the Merton Colliery manager, Edward Potter. And it was here that she got the smallest sense of middle-class life and that she could have a different way of life. As a domestic servant, Mary would be responsible for cooking, cleaning, making fires and helping Edward's wife take care of their 12 kids. Her days would be long and tiring. She was often the first person up on a morning and the last person to go to bed on a night. Over the next three years, Edward gradually began sending his children to boarding school and once there was no children left to look after, Mary was let go and was forced to move back home where she took up dressmaking. On the 18th of July, 1852, at 20 years old, Mary married William Mowbray, who worked as a timekeeper. Promptly after their marriage, the newlyweds moved to Plymouth, where William took up work on the railways. Mary's hope of a new life and a fresh start were quickly diminished when they arrived at their new home. Where they lived would be described as a shanty town, which means that it was a very deprived area. 
while living here the couple would have five children however four of them would sadly end up dying from gastric fever mary began to experience what we would now call postnatal depression this new life that she had dreamed of in plymouth wasn't how she imagined and she was incredibly unhappy so in 1857 mary william and their only surviving child margaret jane moved back up north William began working as a manual labourer in the mines, thus forcing Mary back into the life that she so desperately wanted to escape from. The couple began to rebuild their life and expand their family, welcoming their daughter, Isabella Jane, in September 1858. On the 22nd of June 1860, Margaret, their surviving child from Plymouth, sadly dies from gastric fever. This is the fifth child of Mary and Williams to die. You're probably thinking what I am. How has this not been picked up on or noticed? But back then, children dying from gastric fever or even a common cold wasn't uncommon. Back then, two in 10 babies born in the Northeast wouldn't live past one year old, so no one really batted an eyelid at children dying. Mary and William would go on to have another two children, a daughter in 1861 who they also named Margaret Jane and a son in 1863 named John Robert. Since her dad Michael died in the mines, Mary is aware how dangerous working down there can be. She uses this excuse to encourage William to take out a life insurance policy. He agrees and he takes out a policy covering himself and the family and he pays one penny a week into it. The family make their first claim on the life insurance when their son, John Robert, dies at only one year old. The second claim is made in January 1865 when William suddenly dies from typhus fever. Mary was given a payout of £35 from the insurance company which was about half a year's wages and would roughly work out at about £600 today. Could this be when Mary's motive for murder amplified when there was a monetary gain behind it? Following the death of William, Mary decides to up and move to a coastal town named Siam with her two daughters. While living here, Mary would take in lodgers to help pay for the rent. And this is how she met widower Joseph Natras. The pair would have a very long stretched kind of on and off again relationship. She was never pregnant by him and she had no intentions to marry him. It was just a fling or a bit of fun for them. Within mere weeks of the move, four year old Margaret Jane would die from typhus fever. After Margaret's death, Mary Ann sends her now only living child, Isabella, to live with her own mother, Margaret. Mary is now free from the commitment of her husband and her children, so she thinks that now she can start and try again for this new life that she wished for. At this point, Mary is in her mid-twenties. She has birthed eight children with only one child surviving and she has had one husband die. In 1865, Mary begins working as a fever nurse in an infirmary in Sunderland. While working here, she got to know one of her patients, George Ward, very well. By August 1865, they were married, but their marriage wasn't an overly happy one. Mary found her marriage to George very dull and boring, and whilst being married to George, she was still having flings with Joseph Natras. I don't really understand why, like, Mary remarried like why she married again because like I mentioned earlier she didn't like the idea of living as a woman of her time and being tied down. Nevertheless only two months after their one year wedding anniversary George Ward dies suddenly of cholera and typhoid fever and still no one is batting an eyelid. Mary finds an advert placed in the newspaper by a man named James Robinson. James was a shipwright who had recently lost his wife Hannah in childbirth. He was advertising for a domestic servant to help him look after his five kids, 
he really kind of needed a woman to step in and help keep the house running. Mary reaches out and begins to work for James and within literal days of our starting, James's youngest child dies. During this time, back in Siam, her mum, Margaret, is suffering with hepatitis and she is really poorly. Mary kind of goes back and forth between James's house and her mum's house, kind of posing as this caring, helpful woman when she's in fact stealing from both of them. After Margaret, her mum, confronts her about the stealing, she suddenly dies. After Margaret's death, Mary is forced to take back Isabella. If you remember, Isabella is Mary's only surviving child from her husband, William. Mary and Isabella moved in with James and his family and within weeks, James's healthy children began dying. His son, John, dies in December 1866 and James Jr. dies in April 1867. On the 30th of April, only 10 days after James Jr. dies, Isabella also sadly dies after being reunited with her mother for mere months. James is quite obviously going through a very devastating and heart-wrenching time. First, he loses his wife, Hannah, in childbirth, and now three of his boys are all dead too. He took comfort in Mary and this is how she ended up falling pregnant. Because in those times, pregnancy outside of marriage was such a big thing that was so unacceptable, James was forced to marry Mary on the 11th of August, 1867. The marriage went against the wishes of James's three sisters who really didn't like Mary and were very vocal in expressing this. I couldn't really find out exactly why they didn't like her, but I think it's pretty safe to presume. On the 29th of November, 1867, Margaret Isabella was born. However, she sadly lived a very short life and died at only three months old. Two years later, in June 1869, their son, George, was born. By now, the marriage between Mary and James was completely broken. I mean, he didn't want to marry her in the first place. Death seemed to just follow this woman. And the final straw for James was when he discovered that Mary had actually been fiddling his books and stealing from him. She had stolen in the range of 50 pound from him and ran up a debt of around 60 pound, which in our days would come to about 2,200 pound. After finding this out, James kicked Mary out of the house, which is probably the best thing that he could have done for himself and for their son, George. Because by now, 38-year-old Mary had already potentially murdered 11 people. In March 1870, Mary had moved in with one of her friends, Margaret Cotton. After being kicked out by James, Mary was essentially homeless and she had nowhere to go, so Margaret Cotton took her in out the kindness of her own heart. The pair had known each other for years and Margaret probably felt some sort of sympathy towards Mary, losing all of her kids and her mum dying and now being kicked out, but Margaret obviously had no idea that Mary was more than likely the cause of all those deaths. Living alongside Margaret, was her widowed brother, Frederick Cotton, and his two sons, Charles and Frederick Jr. Unfortunately for Margaret, she had mentioned to Mary that she had a savings pot with about 60 pound in it. Margaret didn't have any children of her own, so if anything happened to her, that money would automatically go to Frederick. Only three weeks after Mary moving in, Margaret mysteriously died. Mary soon falls pregnant, thus marrying her fourth husband, Frederick Cotton. At this time that she was seeing and then eventually marrying Frederick, Mary was still actively having flings with Joseph Natras, who I mentioned earlier on. And funnily enough, Joseph Natras actually only lived a couple of doors down from where she was now living. So the baby that she was pregnant with could have equally been Joseph's as Frederick's, but Mary chased money, so it was Frederick that she said was the father of her child. In 1871, 
Robert Robson Cotton was born and there are now three children in their house. Two days after their one year wedding anniversary, Frederick dies of hepatitis and typhoid. Only three months after his death, Mary moves Joseph Natras into their house. She finds work in a local hospital and this is where she meets John Quickmanning. John is recovering from smallpox and he is Mary's ideal man. He's rich, he's single with no children and he works within the brewery industry. Almost immediately, Mary sets her sights on John. To her, he is a much better catch than Joseph, but because of John's social class, she knew that he would never take on kids from another marriage, so she had to get rid of those in our way. On the 10th of March, 1872, Frederick Jr. dies of gastric fever. On the 28th, her son, Robert, dies of teething and convulsion at only one year old. And on the 1st of April, Joseph Natras dies of typhoid fever. After these three deaths in quick succession, suspicions began to arise. Mary now had only one living child. This was Charles Cotton, who was the youngest son to her last husband, Frederick. Mary takes Charles and offers him to a man named Thomas Riley to try and get Charles into a workhouse. Thomas Riley was from the local parish and he was also the assistant coroner for their area and it was him who had the very first suspicions about Mary. When offering Charles to Thomas, Mary describes him as a weakling who will never grow up. Thomas remarks that Charles looks very fit and well and to this, Mary replies, quote, he will go the same way as the rest of the Cotton family. And on the 12th of July, 1872, seven-year-old Charles dies. It was Charles's death that was the undoing of Mary. Thomas Riley couldn't get away with the comment that Mary had made about Charles dying like the rest of his family. And it was actually said that Mary had told people that she wouldn't be troubled with him for much longer and that he would die within the week. After Charles's death, Thomas Riley spoke to Dr. Kilburn and expressed his suspicions. Because of this, Dr. Kilburn denied issuing a death certificate, which would stop Mary from claiming insurance money from his death. Police are notified and they begin an inquest looking into Charles's death. Unlike anyone else, Charles underwent a post-mortem. The doctor doing this found things that he couldn't explain, but because he couldn't explain them, he couldn't say that Charles was murdered, so his death was ruled as a natural death. The doctor took samples from the post-mortem for further testing, and during this found traces of arsenic. He sent another sample from the post-mortem to a forensic toxicologist in Leeds who confirmed arsenic poisoning. The next day, Mary was arrested on suspicion of murder. During police's investigation, they exhumed the bodies of Frederick Cotton Jr., Robert Robson Cotton, and Joseph Natras. I guess now they were starting to piece everything together. While the bodies were being exhumed, there were massive crowds at the graveyard. Loads of people were trying to get a look and to see what was going on. After the bodies were examined, it was found that all three were found to have been poisoned with arsenic, finding it in their liver, spleen, stomach and kidneys. Mary awaited trial in Durham prison and it was here that she revealed that she was pregnant causing her trial to be delayed for six months. While awaiting Mary giving birth, the media were feeding the public everything about her, her ways, her life and her crimes. She was described as a self-centered thief who was a master of deception. She would take pride in her looks and although she was described as strikingly beautiful, the media claimed that she only done this to get the attention of rich men. The media aired out that Mary would often have the company of many men at once and even that she would lie with other men while being married. She would pursue a man and once she felt that their spark had left or 
he wasn't rich enough or good looking enough or he was even just no longer beneficial to her she would get rid of them obviously all of this caused an outrage with the public and mary was a very hated woman and many even decided that she was a witch on the 7th of january margaret edith quick Manon was born mary's trial began on the 5th of march where she was being tried for only charles's death the defence tried to argue that Charles had died from arsenic poison because he inhaled too much arsenic that was inside the dye on the wallpaper of the house, but this was very quickly thrown out. Throughout the trial, Mary would nurse her daughter and she even breastfed her while she was sat on the dock. The trial lasted for three days and the jury deliberated for only an hour before coming back with a guilty verdict. Mary was then sentenced to death, which for a woman was extremely rare in Victorian times. Before Mary, the last woman to be executed was executed 73 years prior. On the 24th of March, 1873, at 7.55am, baby margaret is taken away from mary ahead of her execution when margaret was taken away mary screamed and wailed and caused a massive scene and many people believe that this was all just a show that it was a last ditch effort to either delay or completely scrap the execution the public executioner known as quart the notoriously clumsy hangsman William Calcroft arrived at Mary's cell and escorted her to the yard. Mary was hung and suffocated for three long minutes until she eventually died. This is something that would happen often when William was in charge of the executions. He was a 70 year old frail man who more often than not wouldn't place the noose correctly so that when the execution took place the person being executed wouldn't wouldn't get their neck snapped they would suffocate instead 50 people arrived at durham goal to watch 40 year old mary ann cotton hang out of 13 children that she birthed only two survived George Robinson, who was the son from her marriage to James, and then Margaret Edith, who was born while she was in prison. Margaret lived up until she was 81, dying in 1954. Although Mary was only charged and executed with Charles's murder, it's believed by many that she is responsible for up to 21 murders. She was considered the country's deadliest killer up until Harold Shipman and that is today's case. It was absolutely fascinating researching and filming this case for you all because some of you may or may not know but I'm actually from Durham myself. Mary Ann Cotton is a name that I've known for a long time but I never really knew the story. People would sing like rhymes about her and I know that some people's parents used to threaten them with Mary Ann Cotton when they were being naughty. Comment down below and let me know what you all think of this case. Did Mary murder everyone in her path or was she an unfortunate woman who death seemed to follow? Thank you all so much for sitting and listening with me today. I have linked all of my social media in the description box if you would like to follow me on any of my other platforms. I cover true crime cases on my TikTok as well. I've also linked all of my source material in the description box as well. Please don't forget to like and share this video and if you haven't already please make sure to subscribe. And thank you all so much again and I will see you all on my next one.